Hi, thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Matt Rosu. I'm Dean and Professor of Economics at Susquehanna University. Thrilled to be joined today by David Brown. Hi, <laughs> thanks so much for having me. I, I'm, I'm, I have to say I've been so impressed with the students and the professors that I've been meeting here. And of course, it's a real joy to get to meet you. It's, it's, it's been a blast. So David's here today. By the time you watch this, it will not be when he's here anymore. But the David's been here working with our students so far all morning and then is giving a public talk tonight. Uh, for those who don't know, David's host of the incredibly popular Business Wars podcast and published a book, The Art of Business Wars, right. which you could see, I don't know if I can get my finger right on it <laughs> like this, but it's behind me in the background. Right. And wanted to talk today, this channel, David, uh, the title of the channel's Econtastic, you know, the making right. economics fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's just, we like to think through fun ways to make economics accessible. So yeah, well, of, by the way, I have to, I have to just insert here. I have just <laughs> had a chance to sneak a peek at uh, Dean Russo's uh, book. This looks like such a fun read. I can't wait to check it out. No, thank Broadway you. Broadway and you. economics, economic lessons from show tunes. So anyway, I, very excited. I appreciate I always appreciate the shout out. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's great. Uh, Hoping today to think through some of the business wars over the years, business competitions, and some of the economic implications behind sure, them. Of course. So economists often like teaching introductory economics, talk about how important like entrepreneurship and innovation is really for economic growth. And the idea economic growth might not sound exciting, but it's the idea of compound interest. If you can get an extra half of a percent in growth or a quarter of a percent in 50 years, in 100 years, you're talking doubling right. of right. well-being. So what are some of your favorite examples that you've seen in terms of where entrepreneurship or the the companies you've studied yeah. have helped yeah. le lead to innovations that have made society better off? Well, you know, of course, when you say better off, I think you uh, that depends on your perspective sure, in, sure, many, sure. in many respects. Um, on the one hand, you know, you think about um, entertainment and the entertainment biz, which is so much a part of post-industrial uh, uh, America, I suppose you could say. And most certainly, uh, the innovations made uh, in the digital realm have been transformational, I think, in, in our economy. Um, I think most people would agree that Apple has been one of the most significant players here. And a lot of people, I think, don't... It's fascinating. I, I, and this is not unique to students at Susquehanna who seem to be incredibly intellectually curious and, and knowledgeable. Um, but I actually... It was a trick question that I put to some students today. I say sure. trick question because I knew what their response was going to be. I said, do you know where podcasting comes from? And no one knew. And of course, as many of your listeners know, it comes from the iPod. And uh, but the iPod, of course, is I mean, it's it's a piece of what is now vintage tech. Sure. Even though I still think of it as rather novel. Yeah. But when um, but Apple's I think Apple's trajectory is really telling. Uh, it began as a kind of a. Uh, an insider's hobbyist's sort of uh, um, enterprise out of a garage, famously, in Silicon Valley. And um, Steve Jobs, uh, working with his partner, uh, Woz, Wozniak, yep. uh, they got together and, and basically using third-party components, uh, put together uh, a device that uh, is, was Apple One. And this was at a time when a lot of young people in Silicon Valley around a lot of the, you know, where the, there was a lot of intellectual capital, they were working on, I mean, Hewlett Packard was based there and they were one of the big players. And so there was parts availability, there was the knowledge, it was a seedbed for a, a lot of technology and remains that way today. But at the time, it was very much a sort of hobbyist enterprise with everyone thinking about how they can build this out to something that is actually monetizable. Sure. Um, that was the start of what would eventually be, ironically enough, the PC revolution. I say ironically because, as we all know, uh, Apple Computer, as it was then called, uh, developed a, a, a device that 
used a graphical interface and would wake up the behemoth IBM uh, and IBM, which was not a slumbering giant, but was really way behind the curve when it comes to personal computers. Um, they were not equipped to adapt to the changes that these hobbyists, quote unquote, were making. And this led, I think, to, uh, it led IBM to take some internally, some radical steps. They created a Skunk Works project within IBM. And uh, that was the only way that they could deal with the corporate culture of IBM at the time. 300,000 employees, they were selling mainframes. They couldn't imagine, yeah. right, that these that laptops. But now here we are using a laptop, you know, we're using a Dell laptop, and we're talking to the world. The world. We're talking to the world. Right? So when you think about transformational uh, businesses, Apple and Compaq and some of the other um, early innovators, I think were, uh, you have to say, at least in modern times, truly transformational. Yeah, I mean, there's the idea that we are talking to the world right now, which it's phenomenal. Could, couldn't happen before, mm -hmm. right? And on technology that you could hold with, literally, I could hold this laptop with two fingers, right? And there's more tech in there than what sent people to the, to the moon. Those initial computers, I mean, led then to another burst of innovation. And I, I think through, we have a lot of accounting majors here. Right. And I think through to Microsoft Excel, and I believe the, was Lotus 123, was that the first one that yeah, the real was. big software? And I remember, I recall hearing stories of a, accountants who saw this happen and they just had tears of joy in their eyes. <laughs> they couldn't believe yeah, right. what this could do. And there were fears at the time, well, like, this is going to wipe out accountants. Like, that's not right. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, we've seen with the, uh, for instance, the digital software we're using now, this hasn't killed Hollywood, if anything. No. It's enhanced it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go back to 1980 and hear George Lucas talking about how uh, transformational uh, the digital age would be for Hollywood, and it has been. I mean, yeah. CGI has made it possible to explore and create new worlds. I mean, Correct. You know, so, uh, yeah, it didn't kill off Hollywood, and it certainly didn't kill off. Yeah. That's one of the things about innovation, I think, that uh, there's always this sort of, I, I want to call it a, it's similar to a moral panic. I mean, when television came sure, out, sure. right? There was this idea that it would kill off movies. And in fact, you know, you think of Robert Putnam and Bowling Alone, and that, that idea that this would break up community and it would, it would tear us apart, uh, maybe it maybe it, it has done some of that, but I think at the same time it's brought together the world in ways that I think few foresaw um, early on. Sure, sure. What's fascinating about some of the technology, and you're alluding to this a little bit, but it's it's not just that Apple created the computer, or then later created the iPhone, mm -hmm. you know, the, right, the smartphone, right. but it's the technology that then comes from that, that we had exactly. no way of expecting. And, and you, you were mentioning this a little bit earlier today, and I think that's it's such an interesting point. I mean, when the iPhone was unveiled, people thought of it as a replacement for their flip phones or their Nokias or their uh, Blackberries, which yep. were, you know. Uh, but what it did with the introduction of the App Store, I don't think a lot of people fully realized, but if you think about it, now you had apps, but it wasn't just apps and a whole industry supplying apps to an App Store. You had the creation of Uber. That now became possible. Yes. And now we talk about companies that are the Uber of whatever that domain Correct. is. Correct, of right? course. Yep. I mean, that came from the iPhone. That's yep. phenomenal. Yep, all of those businesses... Uh, we had uh, an alum who I won't name, but the who created what I would call the Uber for dog walking was one of those. And it built up a, that company and then ended up uh, kind of selling it as an entrepreneur, right. right? And an incredibly useful, incredibly useful innovation. The idea that you're running late, you won't be able to get home to walk your dog, or right. maybe a group is going out for drinks and you're thinking, oh, I've got to, I can't, I'd love to go spend time with my coworkers or, you know, on a social basis, but I've got to get home. No, you go into the app, you, you plug it in, Absolutely. somebody comes and walks your dog. Well, you know, the thing about innovation is that almost always innovation done right is done 
with a view toward the pinch points that consumers are feeling, yep. right? And, I mean, there have been spurts of innovation which have been mostly theoretical and, and that sort of thing. But I think what we're seeing with you know Uber, Airbnb, what you're describing here, I think um, is giving new opportunity to improve the lives of countless people. I mean, Absolutely. Everywhere. Uh, it's, it, you know, I was watching an old Arthur C. Clarke. It was a, a BBC interview from 1968. And he said, one day, one day, there will be surgeons in, at the Mayo Clinic who will be able to perform surgery remotely with someone in, uh, on a, a hospital uh, or a gurney uh, in, a, in a surgical room in India. And it sounded wild, fantastic, and yet wasn't, you know, that long ago that someone demonstrated, I mean, a, a team of, yep. of medical professionals demonstrated how this could be done. And that's, that's here. I mean, we are now right there at that. It's place. amazing. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. I that, almost need a moment to process that idea, but I, I don't know that I quite connected that to the medical realm. That's, yeah. that's absolutely amazing, right? The best doctors halfway across the world right could, exactly. could actually perform a surgery bring, bring somewhere else saving lives mm -hmm. on the other side of the planet yeah um, and I have to say I mean there is something that and I know how much you love Broadway so you, perhaps you'll uh, <laughs> perhaps you'll buy into this romance but you know I remember the first time I saw uh, the SpaceX rockets return okay. to earth right um, space exploration has been incredibly wasteful you know and uh, and one of the reasons that space research got choked up was because you know of funding i mean that was a major issue in the 1970s uh now we're able to reuse those rockets but yeah. to see those rockets land it truly looked like cgi you no, know it's yeah, just yeah. not mind-blowing you know so say what you will about elon musk but the accomplishments there only hint at where this is going to take us tomorrow. Yeah, and what, what I find fun about that, interesting to think about the current space exploration, and I'm, I'm a bit of a libertarian at heart, uh, but it's the idea that the private companies are doing and, and subsidizing this with the idea of they're, they're trying to make money. But I imagine there will be some interesting positive side effects they'll figure out. No question. From no this. question. And and you know even not uh, taking the libertarian uh, a libertarian yeah. posture on this, you can say, well, what does that free up for government? For government to do right, spending the resources exactly. in another way. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And uh, I think that and again, you can make that whole uh, you know pinch point argument. I mean. I think that that is what uh, the technological revolution led by, uh, and I would say it, it would be companies like Apple. Uh, the IBM story is much more complicated and in some ways much more interesting yep. and with other uh, uh, dimensions that uh, are, I think are worth it. I, I, I'll give a shout out. Uh, if you haven't checked out Business Wars, check it out. And I have listened to the... I, I believe it's called the first computer wars uh -huh, i think is the right, title right. where i learned a lot actually about like the history of ibm coming into play right. and, and some of their big competitors it's it's definitely worth a listen uh the book the art of business wars uh can find it at any major online bookseller for sure uh app should check that out as well and don't forget this and one, and, and, and of course. <laughs> the in terms of a next um Thinking through, prognosticating, right, is always tricky. But yeah. if we could try to think through what might the next frontier be, I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on, um, is is it chat GPT? Is that one of the biggest things? And AI, is that one of the biggest things to figure out? Is there something else on your radar where you think this is really a, a, a next frontier? You know, um, this morning I was thinking, <laughs> it's funny, funny how much can change in the course of just a few hours. This morning, I was thinking, well, it's got to be AI. You know, it's got to be. Uh, Chat GPT is in that space. The next war between, uh, the next major computer war is likely to be between Google and Microsoft. Um, and that's going to be over AI uh, yeah, yeah. dominance. And Apple is going to want to have a, a role to play in that, too. But I was just reading this morning, uh, this is late March uh, 2023, uh, that uh, a group of um, 
concerned scientists, I think that's this hints at a parallel, um, have penned a letter saying that they uh, that AI should be um, tightly controlled, uh, if not uh, sort of hinting at uh, perhaps um, restricted in its development because of uh, the profound implications for humankind. And it, it read to me like something that you would have seen from concerned scientists in the uh, late 40s, early 50s after the, you know, nuclear Nuclear bomb. tests. Right, exactly. And, and so I think that when you have people who are involved at that level in science, giving those sorts of warnings, I think it's worth uh, paying attention worth to. Worth heeding. It will be interesting. Yeah, the power of what it can do is, is pretty amazing. And we're, as a business school, we are exploring, like, how can we use uh, chat GPT and mm -hmm. AI to be more effective? more efficient well, you know, and to teach our students to be more efficient. Absolutely, yeah. but, but this is also going to open up other domains. I was just reading, uh, the, here's the counterpoint to that. Sure. The other day uh, I was reading that um, researchers, I believe it's in Britain, have developed a test using AI to identify one particular protein in DNA. <sighs> this is AI yep. that now can predict cancers. I mean, that's fun. that is a huge breakthrough. But here's the thing, with 100% accuracy, according to the story. Jeez, that's amazing. I mean, it's true. I mean, it gives me chills to think about, yeah. you know. So we're just now beginning to open up these frontiers. And who knows, by the way, where this is going. It's going to have to go through a lot of, you know, further tests and trials. And But it, that just hints, I think, at the potential for, uh, for AI. Of course, there are trade-offs. There always are. And this is true in every endeavor. And how we manage those trade-offs, I think, um, will be a challenge. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Uh, pivoting a little bit, right? You've studied a lot of businesses, <laughs> a lot of companies. Uh, I'm going to ask, are there, but I'm sure there are. Where are some examples where you've seen when you've studied the competition between companies where perhaps innovation has been stifled? Uh, well, uh, we were talking about computers earlier. I think an argument can be made that the digital revolution could have come six years earlier, at least six years earlier, yeah. were it not for the corporate culture at the leading um, computer company in the day, which was IBM. IBM yep. Yeah. And, you know, that was a company that at the time employed something like 330,000 people. And their culture was built around selling mainframe computers to large businesses, universities, that sort of thing. And so the margins were big. They also had licensing. That was a big part of IBM's um, you know, structure. Sure. And so everything was organized toward 100% in-house and making these major sales. When PCs, and let me back up, when Apple Computer and those guys began doing their work in their garages, the hobbyists, that was the way that the board at IBM saw these changes in computing technology. Sure. And they simply would not act when younger people on their staff would come knocking on the board's door and say, please, we need to get into this PC revolution. The board just absolutely refused to accept it. And so what happened was the creation of a skunk works within IBM, but that was 1979. 1979. Ultimately, IBM considered buying out a small computer company, basically a, a, one of these, you know, like Compaq. Sure. I forget what the company was. It wasn't that big. But they were going to make it their own. But that went against IBM culture. That could have given them a leg up. So it's a further delay. Meanwhile, the, what, the, what the Skunk Works ultimately concluded was that IBM would have to do something it had never done before in its history. It would have to go to third-party vendors. So instead of all of the R&D and all of the capital that went into developing proprietary products, only 10% of that first IBM PC was really proprietary IBM, yeah. and that was the ROM. So that didn't hit the marketplace until what was the, the, really the early to mid-'80s. Sure. And uh, up to that point, uh, people were using mainframes and they were connected with terminals. You know? Yeah, I mean, and that's, I think, 
thinking through even teaching introductory economics, I would think when a firm has a monopoly, you're less likely right. to see innovation. The other key example where innovation could often be stifled would be if there are government regulations stifling. No Any examples in your business wars where where the government has yeah. one? Yeah, um, Airbnb is a good one. Okay. Um, in fact, when we were working on the Airbnb episode, you know, there are competitors. There are others out there that are doing Verbo or yes, something. Yes, right. Yep. Uh -huh. there, there are lots. So it's not that it, it's unique, but Airbnb was one of the you know prime movers in that space. Sure, uh, and and um, they ran up against uh, an entrenched hotel uh, industry in New York City, and New York regulators wanting to make sure that their their hotel business wouldn't be affected and wanted to obviously curry favor with the sure. with the well heeled uh, owners. Um, they began putting in all kinds of regulations that created this elaborate dance between Airbnb and that was played out, frankly, in cities across the country afterwards. I think that that slowed it down. We saw something similar with Uber in several cities where, sure. you know, the taxi cab industry yep. was something similar. And then, of course, you have the politics that are layered on top of that. That leads to regulation. And, you know, it does tend to slow things down. I remember I was in uh, Austin when uh, there was a South by Southwest, which is a major event for a city the size of Austin. Major. And it's a world event. I mean, I don't yes. mean to, to minimize it in any way. But uh, this was at a time when there were a lot of people in Austin who were concerned about the social implications, no, notwithstanding the impact on the local taxi industry and transportation industry, but a lot of the social uh, ramifications of Uber. And they held a vote on whether or not Uber should be allowed to, to, to operate in Austin. And for a brief period, uh, they couldn't. Uh, and wow. and and this w this happened during South by Southwest, and at the time, of course, there's a tech conference in addition to the music conference. So this w w it was sort of a black eye for Austin. Ultimately, um, it was rolled back, and and there were accommodations made, but and we've seen that in cities across the nation, and and consumers ultimately had their had way. their way. Yeah, yeah, y yeah. It's interesting. The study within economics, it's. It's called public choice theory, yeah. where you start to view politicians and the government through the lens, not that everybody's seeking strictly to maximize the well-being of society. And I think most politicians really do their best, mm -hmm. but rather that they have to maximize their happiness, often with politicians, it means how do I get reelected? Right. And to get reelected, you have to cater to a constituent group where that will provide you the funding that allows right. you to advertise and can lead to some of these side issues where, unfortunately, innovation does distortions get in the marketplace. Yes. Distortions <laughs> the market. right. So, well, thank you. Appreciate really appreciate you being here today to talk to our students and taking a little time today. Once again, I'll remind you that uh, please uh, go check out. The Business Wars podcast for far more, far more information on the way businesses have innovated over time. You can find it probably on any of your favorite yeah. companies. Uh, I've played, grew up playing video games. I found the Nintendo versus <laughs> PlayStation one absolutely fascinating to understand. Like Nintendo did playing cards back in the day and things like that. Uh, you could probably find it on any of your favorite companies. And David, thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you for the invitation. Susquehanna is clearly a very special place. And so it's been a real honor and privilege to get a chance to, to come here, meet the students, and meet you too. Thank, well, thank you. you. And thank you for tuning in. If you like this, uh, please consider clicking like. And if you subscribe to the channel, you'll get updates every time a new video is posted. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.